I'm Mike, and in this episode, contrary to popular belief, humans are best suited to be herbivores. When looking at psychological and physiological features, we are herbivores. Ideal levels of bad cholesterol are only seen in herbivorous populations. Ideal weight in the US is only seen in herbivorous populations. The longest living healthiest culture on earth is the most herbivorous culture. And pretending to be an omnivore is our leading cause of death. Let's be straight, the herbivore view is a very unpopular opinion. Virtually everybody believes that we are omnivores because they themselves are behavioral omnivores. But just because somebody eats meat does not make them an omnivore. Take an animal that is an undisputed carnivore, the cat. Talking about boring vegan foods, the cat eats grass in the wild. And if you have one, you know they love cat grass. So by this logic, cats should be omnivores because they often eat plants, but we deem them carnivores nonetheless, which is a double standard. Herbivore, omnivore, and carnivore are classifications. And the fun thing about classifications is they're man-made. So where does one start and one stop? Where does an omnivore turn into a herbivore? Is it 95% plants, 99% plants? But the question is, what ratio is best for humans? In our culture, acting like an omnivore is normal, but now it's also normal to be sick. Most people have dangerously high cholesterol, and cholesterol can only be gotten from animal-based foods. And even paleo doctor himself, Lauren Cordain, says that the ideal level of LDL, or bad cholesterol, is between 50 and 70. It's the level that our ape cousins have, it's the level that human babies are born with, but when looking at real people, the only ones with these levels are people who elect to be herbivores as a result of their vegan diet. In the Western world, most people are also overweight, but as this chart shows, the herbivorous people are the only ones that average in the normal weight range. Let's look at our psychological herbivore traits. We hate the idea of blood and guts, gore makes us sick, slaughterhouses are like horror houses to the point where it's illegal in certain states to film them in any capacity because we're so disgusted by it that it hurts business, but take an omnivore like a bear and put it in a slaughterhouse and it sees a buffet. Let's play a quick, non-graphic game called Cuddle or Kill. I'm gonna show you a picture of an animal and you can decide whether you wanna kill it and eat it or cuddle it. Here's a cow. Cuddle. Bunny. Cuddle. Deer. I would rather cuddle that. And a pig. But wait, I just chose a baby. That's not fair. Well, if you were a real omnivore, you would love to eat a baby. In fact, that's what they go for. So, either we're an herbivore psychologically, or you're a psychopath. Now let's look at our anatomical herbivore features, starting with our mouth. I'll get to canines in a second, but first let's do the tongue. We, unlike omnivores and carnivores, don't have protein receptors on our tongue, and we also don't have fat receptors, which is why meat is tasteless. But wait, what about bacon and sausages and hot dogs and blah blah blah? Well, guess what? They have added salt, and we have salt receptors on our tongue. Imagine eating that ground up flesh without salt or seasoning, which is actually just another word for plants. You herbivore, you. Now let's look at jaw structure. Like other herbivores, we can move our mouth side to side. Animals like your dog cannot do this, which is called mastication. And then also, if you're looking at other predators and, and omnivores, they have shear-like jaws where their molars are out of line so that they can just chop bone like, like garden shears. Our molars, of course, are directly on top of each other. Omnivores generally have large mouths and throats for their body size. Herbivores, like us, have smaller mouths and throats. So animals that are designed to eat meat don't choke on it very easily. And I know what you're thinking, humans are special, we've got forks and knives, so we don't need a giant mouth to eat meat. But from this study done in San Diego that looked at over a decade of choking data, quote, the most common specified food objects that victims choked on were meat products. Now for our digestive system, omnivore stomachs have a pH around one, which is very acidic for dissolving bone. Well, we have a pH of four to five like other herbivores. Omnivore stomachs usually make up for about two thirds of their digestive tract. Our stomachs only make up for about a quarter of our digestive tract, just like other herbivores. Because of this, a hungry wolf can eat 20 pounds of meat in a single meal, which is the equivalent to a human eating 100 hamburgers. 
Research on our gut bacteria support our herbivore nature, like this study with, quote, the vegan gut profile, which is the herbivore gut profile, appears to be unique in several characteristics, including a reduced abundance of pathobionts, or potential pathogens, and a greater abundance of protective species. And this study shows that quickly after increasing meat intake, our gut bacteria switch to more potentially pathogenic bacteria associated with colitis, leading one of the researchers to say, quote, I definitely feel a lot more guilty ordering a hamburger since doing this work. The most dramatic difference between us and omnivores may be the length of our intestines compared to our body. For omnivores, this is generally four to six times, and for us, like other herbivores, is between like 10 and 12 times our body length. This is huge because it forces our body to deal with the cholesterol in meat during eggs that an omnivore would otherwise be able to quickly slough off out of its system. This issue brings me to the many doctors and researchers that believe humans are herbivores. But I'll just highlight one doctor, William C. Roberts. He headed the pathology Center for the Heart, Lung, and Blood Institute at the National Institute of Health for 30 years and has authored over 1,500 papers, nearly all peer-reviewed. He says, quote, when we kill animals to eat them, they end up killing us because their flesh, which contains cholesterol and saturated fat, was never intended for human beings who are natural herbivores. He argues that when you take an herbivore like a rabbit or a monkey and feed them cholesterol and other animal products, they get clogged arteries, aka atherosclerosis, but you cannot induce this in a dog. And despite a recent campaign largely funded by the dairy industry, cholesterol in food, only animal foods, does clog our arteries. He highlights that since cholesterol is the only risk factor that is required to cause clogged arteries or atherosclerosis, that it must be the cause. And not coincidentally, clogging of arteries is our number one leading cause of death in the form of heart disease and our number five leading cause of death in the form of stroke. And just a reminder, herbivorous people are the only ones with ideal levels of bad cholesterol. To emphasize how bad eating like an omnivore is for us, we can look to the Nazi occupation in Norway. Their deaths from circulatory diseases were going on like normal until 1940 where the Nazis came, took away all their livestock to feed their armies, making them more herbivorous, and all these circulatory diseases in 1940 just started dropping astoundingly until 1945 when the Nazis left where it shot right back up again. And there are other ailments that are caused by thinking you're an omnivore. For example, diverticulitis where you don't have enough fiber plants, you don't have enough plants, to the point where your intestines have to put so much pressure to get things moving that they actually billow out and sort of rupture out to the side. And then there's constipation, and I don't know about you, but every herbivore I've ever talked to has zero issue with this. Now let's look at some of the most common omnivore arguments. We'll start with canines. People who wholeheartedly believe this are out of their mind. It's called canine because of its location, not its ability to pierce flesh, because it's horrible at piercing flesh. Here are the canines of a canine. They're about three times longer than their front teeth, and now here is a human. Their canines are more or less on the same plane as their front teeth. And here is what it looks like if they were functional like a dog's. And finally, here is an herbivore, undisputed, the gorilla, and look at those canines. So the whole canine thing is pretty meaningless. Then once people cave on the canine argument, they usually point to how we are these giant awesome brains and we use tools so we bypass all the rules of evolution. And that somehow, despite having no omnivorous external features, we have transformed our internal organs to be successfully omnivorous. This is completely wrong. Our digestive tract simply remains herbivorous. But it's funny how that mentality has actually crept its way into educational materials like this illustration of a comically short human digestive tract like one you would expect for an omnivore. This is compared to an herbivore, the rabbit. It just doesn't do justice to our average 23 foot long small intestine, which lands us right in about the same ratio between torso length and digestive tract length as that rabbit. Finally, there's the B12 argument that since B12 can be gotten from meat, that we must be omnivores. But according to this logic, all bunnies and elephants and herbivores like them also have to be omnivores, but they actually get their B12 from soil bacteria. In fact, all B12 is made by bacteria. You can also get it from untreated water like the plant-based ultra-marathon running Tara Umara tribe from Mexico, but if you don't want to do that, you can just take supplements instead. Moving on, if we found a new animal that ate 98 to 99% of their calories from plants, we would consider it an herbivore. And that is exactly what the Okinawan people traditionally ate, and they are the longest living, often referred to as the healthiest culture on 
Earth. Is it any coincidence that the healthiest, longest living culture on Earth also happens to be the most herbivorous culture on Earth? No. So you can choose to behave like an omnivore, but the human body does best as an herbivore. As I've shown, ideal levels of bad cholesterol only seen in herbivores. Ideal normal average weight only seen in herbivores. Human gut bacteria being best in herbivores. And the longest living healthiest culture on earth is also the most herbivorous culture. So go herbivore. Thank you for watching.